the stars have aligned, and Rust is now in your Steam library. However, there's a problem. You've logged into a server and don't know the difference between a rock and a torch, an AK and a jackhammer, or the proper situations of when and when not to re. I created this guide because I genuinely want to help out new players or those interested in joining the Rust community. If you're having anxiety because your friends won't explain how to improve your skill or you just feel inadequate while playing the game, don't worry, you've come to the right place. In a nutshell, Rust is a brutal survival game that allows for many opportunities to roleplay, PvP, interact with the environment, and most importantly, survive. Rust can only be purchased in the Steam store. Retail price is $35 USD, but as shown here, is known to drop during Steam sales held throughout the year. You are able to play the game by yourself, with a friend, or a group of friends on the same server. Player count heavily impacts your experience, which is why server selection can make or break your wipe. The wipe refers to when the server restarts. The comment schedules are weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly. A general rule of thumb is the first Thursday of every month is a force wipe from Face Punch. Sometimes it doesn't happen, but the community servers will wipe anyway. There are two types of wipes. Map, which removes all structures built and items collected, Blueprint slash full, which removes all structures built, items collected, and learned. Just keep the wipe schedule in mind and read the server description to make sure you're picking the best server for your need. I recommend newer players staying away from official, i.e. rustified, rusty moose, because the players are far more advanced than you're ready for. Simply navigate to community, search key phrases for your server requirement, and select any server that looks good to you. Modded may be a viable option if you don't have enough time to devote per day, but I highly recommend vanilla without any enhancements. This will ensure you get the full rest experience as Helk intended. The game is always active, which means your livelihood can be challenged at any time. Unlike other games, bases can be raided while the owner is not logged into the game. This is referred to as offline raiding. It's recommended to build smart versus big to ensure everything is intact prior to your next login. There are many techniques that you can research on YouTube, but I will show you the basics that will help you survive on Wipe Day. Getting a base down on Wipe Day is generally my number one priority. The first step in building a base is claiming your territory. This can be stressful when the server population is full because you may feel rushed, the prime locations you want to build at are already taken, or you don't really understand the map yet and you don't know where a good place is to build. I recommend building in areas where you don't have to deal with neighbors. To get started, build a 2x2 two two with one triangle airlock in the front. This will require 6200 stone, 1100 wood, and 1200 metal frags. The tool cupboard upkeep is only 690 stone and 144 metal frags, both of those are required every 24 hours to ensure your base does not decay. Amenities include 7 large wooden boxes, 5 small furnaces, and a level 1 or level 2 workbench. Ensure all of your stone walls are facing in the proper direction. To confirm the hard side is facing outwards, your base should look like this, where you actually see a defined stone texture on the wall. If one of the walls is lightly colored, like this, it means you have the soft side facing out and the hard side facing in. This will put you at a disadvantage because people can raid this relatively easy without explosives. All they need is approximately 8 metal pickaxes, they can chip through the wall, and they've bypassed the airlock you have in the front of your base, and then if they have satchels they've saved on raiding costs and they're on their way to get the rest of your loot. So if you do see this, make sure you rotate it to have the hard side facing outwards. Also ensure the doors opening in the front are set up to prevent door campers from going deep in your base. And in terms of the raiding path, 20 satchels will gain you both TC and main loot, either by going through all of the doors placed up in sheet metal or going through two stone walls on the back side of the base. 
As you can see, the 2x2 without honeycomb is not meant for long-term use. Whether temporary or your main, it's highly recommended to do everything you can to make raiding more difficult, whether it's adding honeycomb, upgrading the walls to higher materials in the core of your base, or finding better doors, such as a garage door. It's common for new players to not really have a base design in mind, so if using this for one to two days, I would recommend making it more fortified. This will require 17,300 stone, 4,200 wood, and 2,200 metal frags. Tool cupboard upkeep is 2,200 stone and 339 metal frags every 24 hours. Amenities include six large wooden boxes, six small furnaces, and a level one or level two workbench. In addition, this design requires the reinforced glass window and metal vertical embrasure. For the efficient raiding path, this will cost raiders 46 satchels to main loot, TC, and no furnaces. Or 60 satchels for everything. If you have garage doors instead of sheet metal double doors, add 25 satchels to each total. It requires 9 satchels to go through one garage door. This isn't a base building video, it's a relatively simple design expanding the 2x2 by adding some honeycomb, half walls on the top, upgrading your internal core to sheet metal, and making it a little fortified on the inside. Last but not least, place down your sleeping bag. This will give you a respawn point when the inevitable happens. You die. Now that you have a base, it's time to venture out and begin collecting that sweet, sweet loot. Rust has three main biomes. The desert, where heat, trees, and cacti are prevalent. The snow, also known as node heaven, generally has a surplus of all nodes, and most of the time you can find bears roaming around. And temperate, where there's a mixture of nodes, trees, and collectible items. Items to increase health, food, and water levels can be found throughout the map. Mushrooms and cloth are common in temperate forest areas. Pumpkins and corn are found near streams. Food crates with random healing items are found in loot piles and monuments. Water can also be found in streams, lakes, food crates, and the outpost. Though Rust can seem peaceful and quiet sometimes, you will hear a variety of sounds during any journey. It's critical to learn and understand all of these sounds to increase your chance of survival. I created a video showing all weapon sounds in the game from multiple distances to help you on your journey to know your sounds. Feel free to check it out. Keep in mind, there are other things that walk the Rust Earth outside of animals and players. The NPCs. Each type of NPC can be destroyed and looted, where quality of loot increases the type of NPC. Most common NPCs are the scientists. Scientists can be found on many parts of the map outside of monuments. They can be protecting loot piles as well. Common scientists drop scrap and generally a green card, flare, or metal pickaxe, or various components. Next up is the Chinook. The Chinook flies around, basically whenever it feels like it, and drops a lock crate at a random monument. Though you're not able to destroy this vehicle, it will target and shoot if you're in the flight path. To access this loot, you need to hack the crate by pressing E and guard it for 15 minutes. The crate will provide loot between tier 1 and tier 3 level items. Once the crate is dropped, the lock crate will appear on the map to all players, which can make the guard more interesting and potentially rewarding. Bradley the tank is far from a silly cartoon character. It is a tank that patrols a launch site and will attack players when crossing its path. If being targeted, Bradley will cycle between missiles and machine gun rounds. The easiest way to destroy Bradley is using two C4 explosives either from a roof or from the guard station in the front. Bradley yields two elite crates ranging from tier two to tier three level items. Once destroyed, the debris field appears on the map to all players. This NPC comes in handy when looting launch. In a way, he's like a 
personal security system that will alert you other players are in the monument if they cross this path. You can also farm Bradley once the debris field cools down, which takes approximately five minutes. The attack helicopter is hands down the most targeted NPC when appearing on the map. Referred to as Heli, flies in the sky and brings an aerial assault on anyone crossing its path. It will attack those roaming if they have a weapon in the hotbar or more than two pieces of clothing. To properly take down Heli, you will need a sturdy base, weapons using 5.56 rifle ammo, and plenty of critical hits on the top middle and back left propellers. Just like Bradley, once destroyed, the heli wreckage will appear on the map to all players. From this, you can get four crates with loot ranging between tier two and tier three level items. Also like Bradley, all of the heli parts can be farmed once the material is cooled down, which takes approximately five minutes. The best crate you're hoping for is two C4 and three rockets, but you'll most likely get weapon attachments or pistol slash 556 ammo. The final thing to mention about the map is Rust has day and night cycles, making the adventures more interesting or spooky. Now that we've covered the map, let's talk about the methods of transportation available. Starting with the simplest method, your feet. Chances are, you'll be using them the majority of the time during your wipe. Hold W to walk, Shift and W to sprint, and Control to crouch. It's recommended to set a keybind to run automatically so that you don't develop carpal tunnel or arthritis in your pinky. I personally use bind Q, forward, and sprint. You can also look while running. Simply hold Alt and drag your mouse in the desired direction. The first vehicle you might stumble upon are horses. There is no taming mechanism yet. The rest community believes it may be added in the future, so we'll have to look for the updates and see whenever Hulk decides to add it. To mount, simply walk up to the horse and press E. Then, once on the horse, regular move functions apply, either using W or Shift and W to sprint. And control if you want to flex on people. The horse requires food, or it will disappear. Ensure to bring enough corn or pumpkins if using the horse for long journeys to make sure this doesn't happen. Horses can also be used to boost on top of bases. I don't know if this is going to be fixed in the future, but it's currently, I guess you could call it an exploit, and you can do it. All you have to do is park the horse close enough to the base Jump on top of the horse, and then jump on top to get on top of the base. Next, minicopters. These can be found randomly on the roads, are able to seat up to two players, can be driven on land using Control and W, or flown over the map. If players on the map take all of the minicopters they see, the respawn will be decreased, it'll take a long time to find them until they either blow up, or somebody else steals it, or they crash. First, you need to store the fuel in the fuel storage. Press E to mount, press W to get the propeller going, then either hold control to drive on the road, or hold W and use your mouse to fly it in the air. The different controls are A, to rotate the helicopter left, D, to rotate the helicopter right, mouse push forward to tilt it, increase the speed, mouse pull backward, to decrease the speed, gain altitude. Mouse move left to tilt your helicopter to the left and to the right to tilt it to the right. And another critical one, S, to slowly and steadily decrease altitude to ensure you can land your helicopter effectively. And spacebar to eject. If your mouse has customizable DPI settings, I recommend using a lower DPI because it will drastically improve your flight skills and won't react to too sensitive mouse movements. Hot air balloons were also added to the game, giving an option for multiple people to travel by air. To board, all you have to do is walk into the box section, place your low grade fuel in the storage above, and press the burn button to activate. As you can see, this vehicle normally takes a long time to get off the ground, so if you're trying to run away 
from a gunfight, or you're just trying to get back to base quickly, this isn't the fastest method of transportation. This vehicle requires low-grade fuel, and control via the wind patterns by looking at the flags here, and it has one small stash for storage. Though it was added to the game, I prefer using anything else outside of this vehicle because it's generally a pain to fly, and it's not really fast, and sometimes it's known to glitch if you're standing in the window, you can accidentally fall out, or just randomly die for no reason. The remaining vehicles allow you to travel by water. The boats. There are two models, the rowboat and Rahib, also known as the Rib for short. Note, both of these require low-grade fuel for use and wood with smelted metal fragments for repair. The rowboat is most commonly found on land, can seat up to four players, has a maximum of 400 HP, and has one small stash for storage. The rib is mostly found further out in the water, can seat up to six players, has a maximum of 500 HP, and one large box for storage. Though both travel on water, the rib is much faster and preferred by the rust community. If the boat is already in the water, to use all you have to do is mount. If you're not already in the driver's seat, press X to rotate to get into the driver's seat. Go to the fuel tank, press E, add the fuel, press E to start the engine, WASD will allow you to drive on the seat. Players generally use the boats when traveling to off-land events, such as the oil rig or the cargo, or if they don't have a minicopter and they're traveling to different areas to farm and return back to base. It's also best practice to bring rad suits. Why, you may ask? Well, sometimes you may accidentally fall into the water or step in it when you're crouched, say you're at oil rig, crouching and shooting scientists. It'll bring your wetness level up, and if you're in areas like the snow part of the map by the oil rig, it's going to affect your health long term, especially if it's close to the night cycle. Even though it's not instant, putting on the hazmat suit will decrease your wetness over time in approximately one minute. At this point, you should understand the map and the different modes of transportation to get around the map. Now let's talk about gathering components and materials. To craft anything in Rust, you need a base ingredient, whether it's raw materials, refined materials, components, or crafted items. Materials are found throughout the map. Components can be found in monuments, barrels, and loot piles. Each barrel contains scrap and a random component. Each loot crate contains scrap and a random item, ranging from clothing to weapons. Loot piles also contain crude oil, low-grade fuel, which are the red barrels, food crates, and hardware boxes. The hardware boxes are nice because you can find tools such as a metal pickaxe, a salvaged ice pick, a chainsaw, a jackhammer, a regular pickaxe, or you can find low-grade weapons or armor. Pretty quickly, depending on how fast you farm, you may accumulate a lot of items in your inventory. Once you have, it's time to hit the recycler. Now, the majority of monuments have their own recycler, but in my opinion, it's best to recycle in safe zones like the outpost or the bandit camp. All items have a different scrap material table you will learn as you play the game over time. In addition to the recycler, outpost has pretty much everything that will help get you started to a great wipe, such as vending machines to purchase various items or resources, the research table to learn items before heading back to base, the barbecue for cooking up any food that you might have that's uncooked, the water catcher, two level one workbenches, one small oil refinery, and the unconditional love from the NPCs protecting you from other players. If anybody attacks you in the outpost, or any safe zone for that matter, don't worry about it. When you die, your bag is unlootable, so you can still go back and get it eventually, the person who shot you will be destroyed by the NPCs on site, and they'll have a 30 minute cooldown from returning to the monument. Here are some additional tips and tricks on using the outpost correctly. Trading stone for wood. Farming is fun and all, but you can get 20,000 wood in a matter of seconds. Simply trade 6,000 stone at the resource vending machine. Doing so will have a very beautiful inventory of 20,000 wood. Convert one tactical glove into 200 cloth by only spending 40 scrap. 
After purchasing this item, recycle it and split out the refined sewing kits and rope. Doing so will result in 200 cloth. Purchase low grade fuel with scrap. Sometimes animals are hard to come by, which reduces your fuel from the animal fat you would harvest. However, bring in 100 scrap and walk away with a full stack of low grade fuel. And last but certainly not least, purchase the jackhammer. Sure, it costs 150 scrap, but it farms nodes very quickly and it could also be used as a raiding tool. The bandit camp offers similar features in addition to gambling. However, there is only one safe room in the gambling area. For more on gambling, refer to Zoom B and Jay Swag's videos in the description below. The common question I hear from Rust players is what does it take to craft X? Well, you can easily answer your question by using the craft menu. To access, press tab, click on crafting, key in the item in the search bar, and observe the required materials. In order to craft a non-basic item, you will need to learn the blueprint. This process requires a research table, the item to be researched, and scrap. Research tables require a level 1 workbench. Once placed, the item can be picked up by using a hammer, as the placement is not permanent. If you find an item that you really want to research, all you have to do is simply place the desired item on the research table and take note of the required scrap for the blueprint. Helk decreased the research cost across all items recently, and it makes it a lot easier, so normally this would cost 750 scrap, but now it only costs 500. Once you have gathered the scrap, place it on the table. Click Begin Research, and voila! The BP is available for you to learn. Pay attention to the workbench required for crafting. This is listed underneath the item name. There are three types of workbenches, as well as three levels of items. The level one workbench, level two, and level three. Note you cannot go directly from level one to level three because each workbench requires the previous level to craft. To craft an item, place the required ingredients into your inventory Stand next to the workbench required and craft. Depending on the item, using workbenches above level 1 can increase the craft time. Unfortunately, anything on level 3 is already at its maximum craft. It's recommended to craft on higher level workbenches to be more efficient with your crafting. Once the craft is started, you can walk away from the workbench, but note, if you're using items below that workbench, it will default to the max crafting duration on the next item if you do not return to the workbench in time. Workbenches also give the option of performing experiments. This is when you place a certain amount of scrap on the workbench, click begin experiment, and it will provide a random blueprint that you don't have for that level. Level 1 requires 75 scrap, level 2 requires 300 scrap, and level 3 requires 1000 scrap. Now, this can be good and bad, but just know, if you're trying to get that single armored door on the level 3, it may take you 4 to 6 tries, which is 4 to 6000 scrap. Once the workbenches are placed, they cannot be picked up, however, they can be rotated by using the hammer. Underneath the level 2, you can place one small wooden box, and the level 3, you can place two. You have to place the first one vertical, as so, and then rotate the workbench, place another vertical box, and now you have two boxes underneath your level three. This is it. You've gone through Rust basic training, and now it's time to loot the monuments. There are multiple monuments on and off land, We'll work our way up from the basic to more complicated puzzles. We will begin with the lighthouse. You've most likely spawned on a beach and wondered, what the heck is that red tower? Well, this is generally the designated location for fresh spawns, either spawning into the server, or when you F1 kill, or when you die if you don't have a bag. Here you will find a green key card, recycler, and an assortment of barrels and loot crates. Moving inland, you will run into an abandoned supermarket or Oxum's gas station. Though these early monuments don't have radiation, it's recommended to gear up. These will also have a green key card, a recycler, food crates, and an assortment of barrels and up to two loot crates. Once you've collected a few electric fuses and green key cards, 
you have the option of going to better monuments. The next logical step is Harbor. It's relatively large, has a recycler, small oil refinery, and barrels or loot crates scattered throughout the area. The main reason you're here is to quickly get a blue key card. This monument has two different layouts where the puzzle is either located in the center or slightly off to the left. To access this puzzle, place the electric fuse in the fuse box, swipe the green key card, and pick up the loot crates available as well as the blue key card on the table. From here on out, you're required to have gear with at least 13% radiation protection, unless noted otherwise, because the monuments are radiated and you cannot go and loot them naked. Next we have the dome. This was one of the original popular monuments that people went to, people still go to, and it's very popular for PvP. This does not require any key cards, so all you have to do is literally climb your way up to get to the top of the monument. Once you get to this jump here, I normally leave that box. The loot in there is normally not worth it. And as you can see, it's risky jumping down to that beam going across and then going across the beam and jumping back up. Once you get to this jump though, I normally wait until I get into half of this square when I make the jump, just to make sure I don't fall. Once you get to the top, you feel that you've conquered the world until you figure out you don't remember how to get back down. Let me help you with that. Simply, come back the way you came. And then, instead of climbing back down that way, jumping across, going through the bottom of that, I recommend going this path. What you'll have to do is crouch and hug the wall to the right as much as you can to not sustain any fall damage. Next stop is the sewer branch. It has plenty of barrels and loot crates scattered throughout. As you can see below in the tower, there can be up to four potential loot crates for you to get by completing the jump puzzle. You can also go underneath in the cave to get a couple of loot boxes or food items. To access this puzzle, you will need to go to the building connected to the above ground recycler and place an electric fuse in the box. Go underground, swipe the key card, and commence looting. This monument has two exits and gets pretty dark when you're underground. It's recommended to bring a flashlight or a torch and use the proper exit depending on the situation above. The final green puzzle is SATS, also known as the satellite dish. This monument was relatively popular back in the day, but has since become barren because most players don't like the loot here and they don't really come this way. Place the fuse in the fuse box. Swipe the green key card. And loot the blue key card on the table, as well as the two loot crates. As we say farewell to the green puzzles, it's time to say hello to the blue monuments. I recommend using a rad suit because most of the time you're going to have a surplus of these in your base anyway, and it will come in handy in certain monuments. The train yard. Here you will find a plethora of loot scattered throughout above and underground between barrels, loot crates, and military crates. The blue puzzle requires two switches to be activated. One on the first floor of the recycler building, second the tower as shown in the bottom right of this image where you have to climb to the top and flip the switch. Note with the tower you are required to use a rad suit otherwise you will not be able to get to the top without receiving damage from radiation. Once both switches are activated, you need to navigate to the main building, as you can see with the pipe connected below, put in an electric fuse box, turn on the switch, and go to the loot rooms. Now, just my personal preference, I skip the green card room because generally you get one box in there and a couple of barrels. All of your money's worth is going to be in the blue room. Swipe the blue key card, observe the wonderful boxes of loot, and be sure to pick up the red key card on the table behind you. Water treatment plant. As you can see, this one is relatively large. As you can imagine, 
every little crevice, every tunnel, there's some kind of barrel or loot box waiting for you to pick it up. But for me, I generally skip all of that and I go straight to the main building as shown in the center of the screen. Once at the main building, go up to the wheel, hold E to turn to raise the door. Once you're inside, you'll be greeted with many loot boxes on the first floor. Navigate to the second floor, place the electric fuse to activate the fuse, and go to the top right of the monument, as shown in the image, to loot the blue room. Once inside the main loot room, you have six loot crates available to you that will be a mixture of regular loot crates and military crates. Once finished looting, go to the room behind it where you will see the switch on the wall and the red card on the table to the left. Flip the switch so you can exit through the door you came in originally. The final blue puzzle is the airfield. Now this monument is just massive, it's actually a really popular place for PvP and can be pretty hectic when you're trying to go into your routine looting. For me, I generally avoid this because in the past when I've gone underground to get the loot, the loot hasn't been the best, it really wasn't worth the effort put in, and it, you know, I either died or it was just a waste of time and the loot wasn't that good. Scattered throughout again are barrels and loot crates and the various towers, hangers on the right hand side, but we're going to focus on the main building which is on the left hand side. The difference with this blue monument is it requires a green and a blue key card as well as two electric fuses. Place the first fuse in the box, turn on the timer, and go underground to the tunnel. Note the fuse box is timed. If you take too long getting to the green door, the power will shut off. Once in, look to your right, there should be a military crate or loot box ready for you. To the left, you might find some barrels or more loot boxes in the doors, but we're going to go straight across to the armory. To the right, there will be some kind of box available for you. Go around towards the back side where the fuse box is on the wall, place the fuse, and go through the door. It's very important to look around each shelf to make sure you don't miss a box. The only thing I like coming here for is the red card if I need to, otherwise I'll go to a different blue monument. Once finished looting, there are many exits you can take, either the way you came up, this door to the right, go to the hallway, make a left or a right. It's all based on the situation above ground. And now my favorite monument, the launch site. Here, there are even more loot crates and barrels scattered throughout the monument. I'm not going to show you every single one of them. Just know, everywhere you go, there's most likely some loot waiting for you around the corner. As mentioned earlier in the video, this monument is patrolled by Bradley, the APC, so you'll have to maneuver around him while he's making his rounds. To activate this puzzle, you literally need to go on opposite ends of the monument. Starting with the bottom left corner next to the three circular water tanks, you need to activate the green card room by swiping the green card and putting an electric fuse in the box. Once that is turned on, you need to run to the opposite top right corner of the monument to activate the other fuse box by putting the box in and flipping the switch. You only need cloth, I'd bring around 100 or 125, with a full water jug as well to kill the radiation. Once both of them are on, the red door will be powered and you'll be able to swipe the red key card to gain entry to the main building. Once you're in, go to the middle and climb the ladders. I generally skip all of the other crates not in my direct path because time is limited and I want to make sure I get to the top to get the best loot before anybody else does. Exit on level 6, make a right, jump over, grab this military crate, and run straight across. If you made it to the top successfully, Congratulations, you have plenty of loot waiting for you. You have three elite crates with other boxes available. And sometimes like this, the loot can be junk. But that's just how it goes. You know, there's really nothing much you can do about it outside of jump from the top of launch. To get down, all you have to do is just run through that door, go to the bottom stairs. Once you're at the bottom floor, Go back to where you came in, there's a room behind it where you can actually flip the switch and enable power to exit the door. Now you have the option of exiting outside of this door 
or exiting outside of the door across the way. I've been going across the way more often because the last couple times I've come out this door, it's normally been camped by somebody and it was harder to defend and escape out of this door compared to the one across the way. Now, this monument back in the day, before they added NPCs, was great. I'm talking about the military tunnel. You were able to go down, get good crates, come back, everything was fine. Even when they added in the NPCs, it was totally fine. But after a few updates where they adjusted the aim, where it's practically aimbot where you go down, if you don't know what aimbot is, it's basically they can shoot you through anything and they don't miss any shots. It's been really hectic. So I'm actually going to skip this monument in the interest of time, mainly because the type of loot that you can get out of this, you could easily get at launch site, the oil rig, or even the cargo ship. I'm sorry if this upsets you that I'm not showing you how to go through the military tunnel, but if you go back and watch my streams or every time I play Rust and people ask me about the military tunnel, I absolutely hate going through this because it's really not worth the time that you're putting into it. Ah, uh, yes, the cargo ship. One of the best things they've added... Oh, we'll just let it finish. One of the best things they've added on the water since boats and, I guess, loot piles. With the cargo ship, you have a chance of three elite crates and three Chinook crates where you get a good amount of loot, and the scientists really aren't that hard to kill. Once you've taken out all the scientists, it's pretty much a waiting game. Just waiting for the other sirens to go off and hack the other crates and try to get that high tier loot that you ever so crave. Next we have the small oil rig, one of the relatively newer monuments, where you have a chance of killing a bunch of scientists, hitting a lot of barrels, finding some loot boxes, getting to the red card room, and unlocking the crate while calling in the heavy scientists. And the final monument is the large oil rig. It's a similar concept to the small oil rig, except it's larger. There are a lot more enemies. There is a lot more loot scattered throughout. The best thing that I can say about this is if you come up here, make sure you bring enough meds, enough food, enough cloth, enough ammo, at least one automatic weapon, and a long range gun, like a rifle or a python, to help you out when you're fighting them from a distance, especially when you're fighting the heavy scientists. When you actually get to the top of the large oil rig and you call in the heavy scientists, you can hide behind this crane here in the corner and you can pop out and take shots from the left or the right. Now, if you are sloppy with it and you peek too long, they will shoot you and you will die because the scientists have aimbot. But you can generally get away with it by crouching in this corner here, popping out, shooting them, and taking your time healing in between. Hopefully you had fun watching the video and learned a thing or two about this game we call Rust. Thanks again. That's all I have, guys. I appreciate it. We'll see you later. Thank you.